Welcome to Municipal Affairs. I am your host, Christopher Brown. Today, we embark on a journey through the inaugural day of the Rural Municipalities of Alberta Spring Convention, hosted in Edmonton, Alberta, on March 19th and 20th. Alberta Minister of Municipal Affairs Rick McIver opened the two-day conference with a pitch to those in attendance that he, alongside Alberta Premier Danielle Smith, were working with rural municipalities to address their issues. Now, here is his address to delegates. For those who are watching this on YouTube, just note, please note, that this is an audio-only part of the episode. Good morning. And the big question is, how much more Paul? Anybody, anybody else have one of these buttons? Yes, okay, how much more, Paul? 233 days, it, it says here, uh, four hours, 35 minutes, and 47 seconds, and we'll treasure every second, sir. Good morning. Thank you for the kind introduction, uh, President Paul, and uh, thank you to Rural Municipalities of Alberta for uh, allowing me to be here with you this morning. And uh, I would like to uh, begin by recognizing that we are gathered on the traditional territory of the uh, signatories of Treaty 6. And I would also like to acknowledge the Métis people of Alberta that have a deep connection with this land. And folks, we are all Treaty people. I'm, uh, hap I'm happy to be here with you today to, uh, at another gathering of RMA. Uh, as uh, your president likes to remind me that you and we are, I guess I'm from the rural municipality of Alberta, or of uh, Calgary, so I will say we are uniquely rural and your perspective and priorities reflect that fact. Uh, I'm grateful to hear directly from you. I was uh, able to attend some of the hospitality suites last night and I heard directly from a lot of you. And uh, one thing I love about uh, municipal politicians and our uh, especially our rural municipal uh, politicians that you are not afraid to tell me what's on your mind and it's actually fun and it's helpful so I appreciate all of that and I certainly uh, enjoyed hearing from a number of you last evening and I'm sure we're going to hear more today and uh, the other thing I wanted to know is those pom-poms those were put on your table for this speech so use them liberally okay don't uh, right thank you there we go this is a valuable opportunity for me today to uh, talk to about our government's caucus and my cabinet colleagues, uh, some of whom you'll get to hear from today and some of the things that we are uh, trying to get done for you. And uh, I know that you will have many great questions for us. And uh, thank you all for traveling across the province to get here together because uh, these types of gatherings were really the work gets done. These uh, The formal meetings are important, but actually, the coffee sessions and those times over uh, a coffee or a cocktail in the evening, lots of times when you can say what you really think are great opportunities to uh, find out what other municipalities have done to solve their problems and share those, uh, share those uh, great ideas with each other. So that's all, I think, in my opinion, that's an important part of what we do here too. My ministry has uh, been at work the past few months, so I'll uh, try to update you on a number of the things that we're working on. I uh, also want to take a brief moment to recognize a special group of individuals in this room, Alberta's latest crop of municipal interns. You know who you are. As some of you know, Alberta's municipal intern program is an opportunity for new and recent post-secondary graduates to gain practical experience in municipal administration, finance, and land use planning. Uh, we all know we need uh, able capable, talented young staff to uh, take over municipalities eventually, but to start learning now so that they know how much fun it is and they stick around because every municipality needs them. So I would like to say congratulations to this year's interns for taking what your first steps in what we all hope in this room will be a long career in public service. And now I would like to ask if there's any interns here, please stand up so that we can thank you for being here and thank you for being interns. Okay. I can't wait to hear about all the great work you uh, will do, not only this year, but in many years to come. So, uh, through internship programs like this, I know uh, our, our government can, uh, helps our graduates gain valuable experience, and, uh, and as I said before, we need, we, uh, if you're an intern, rest assured, we need you. So, Budget 2024 is a responsible plan for a growing product, province that uh, invests in Alberta's communities by managing our resources wisely. 
The budget our government tabled two weeks ago includes the local government fiscal framework, which replaces the Municipal Sustainability Initiative as Alberta's primary capital funding program for members of RMA and all of the other Alberta municipalities. As you all know, the LGFF has been years in the making, and RMA has been part of a collective effort to build a predictable, sustainable funding model that municipalities can count on. I don't think there's a better example of collaborative and practical decision-making than the LGFF. It's a key part of Alberta's government's budget for 2024-25 and future fiscal years. But the, uh, and let's, let me just say thank you, because, uh, whether you love it or whether you hate let me say this, if you love it, give yourself, reach around, give yourself a pat in the back because this was your idea. And if you hate it, well, then I don't know what to tell you. But uh, anyways, it's there, you asked for it, you've got it. And I think you should feel good about it. Um, I, I, I appreciate uh, no matter what we do and no matter how we do it, the money that our government furnishes to municipalities in your opinion will never be enough. Uh, I've, I've uh, heard that from some of you, and I, I'm good with that. I respect that. I've always said that if municipalities are not asking for more money, then you're not doing your job right. So uh, fortunately, I think everybody here is doing their job right. So uh, this is uh, it's, uh, it's a good thing, and we need to hear it. It actually, as your advocate within government and within cabinet, it helps me to have the information I need to... Um, advocate for you in the best way possible, armed with the information that you share with me. So, and we all know everybody has aging infrastructure compounded by inflation, and uh, all of us in this room are feeling it acutely. Uh, the, uh, the LGFF is meant to deliver two things, predictability for municipalities and sustainability for our province. Predictability in the provincial support is something you have been asking for for a long time, and by saying yes to you at the LGFF, this is our government saying yes to that. And it's something we've been actively working on, on with you. So when we're able to provide capital funding consistently based on our own revenues at a level that Alberta taxpayer can afford, we think that is a good balance of how to do things. And the fact that we were able to tell you even before this budget came out what your LGFF increase next year will be, not this year starting April 1st, but the April 1st after that uh, in the neighborhood between 13 or 14 percent is based on the increase of government revenues two years ago. And the next fiscal year, of course, ends the end of this month, which is in about a week and a half and won't be too long before we'll be able to. Uh, and so we already know from last year that the uh, after the LGFF goes up by about 13, 14 percent next year, based on government revenues, it'll drop by around a percent and a half with the year after that. We'll know that exactly after the end of our fiscal year in a week and a half and when the books get done. And we think that type of predictability is valuable to municipalities. Because the last thing you want to do, because not every construction project we do can be done in the same fiscal year. Sometimes they go over the winter and into a couple years. And the worst thing that could happen is if you think you got a certain amount of funding, you contract with somebody to build it, and then it's, oh, whoops, you're getting less money than you thought. So now you got to, it just gets expensive, complicated, and uh, hard to deal with. So we believe that that kind of predictability is something that will be welcome. Uh, also, the revenue index factor, the fact that the money goes up and down provincial revenues at exactly the same percentage as provincial revenues, good work on the lobbying. It uh, took you a little while to get us there, but we're there. So again, you're going to reach around and give yourself a pat on the back because we think that's important. Uh, you've told us that you think that's important, and together we've got it done. And uh, I think there's a theme there too. The more we do things together, the better chance there is of us succeeding because we do that best when we do it together. So uh, again, uh, as of last December, you knew two years ahead what your LGFF funding would look like. And uh, we are uh, very happy that uh, you have uh, walked with us down the road to get to that point. So it's... Uh, what else we got to talk about here? Okay, LGFF funding will increase. Okay, we talked about all that. Um, but the other thing that is in the uh, budget, because uh, there is, we all have crumbling aging infrastructure, 
is our government will be investing in the next three years $25 billion in capital funding. Uh, and of course, because pretty much everything that happens in Alberta happens in a municipality. So that's $25 billion we'll be spending in, uh, to build schools, hospitals, roads, and other infrastructure, all of which matter to municipalities. Uh, won't name every one of those capital investments, but uh, I will mention one thing, a new program for municipal affairs that uh, will affect some people in this room. It's a new program, the Local Growth and Sustainability Grant, or LGSG. This new grant will provide $60 million over three years to help relieve some of the pressure on local infrastructure and high growth communities. It's uh, designed uh, for municipalities that do what your government asks you to do, and we always ask you to do this, to be part of developing Alberta's economy and bringing in new business, new jobs, new opportunities for your residents. And this is uh, meant to assist municipalities with some of those things. Sometimes when a new company, business comes to your municipality, there's things that you have to do. It may be uh, improve an intersection. It may be, I don't know, maybe expand, do something with your water, sewer treatment. It might be some other uh, amenity that they need to go there. This is meant to help with that. Uh, our plan is to use the program to address emerging infrastructure priorities and economic development opportunities. Uh, the, now, the exact criteria, here's the fun part. The, the, you can call it a bad part, but I think if you think about it, it's a good part. We don't have all the, the uh, details around this yet. The good part about it is we're going to develop those, those uh, details with you. Okay, again, it's another example of, of working with you. It's uh, $20 million a year. We feel quite confident that if we get the rules and regulations and the uh, applications in place with your assistance by uh, this fall, that uh, we'll still be able to get that uh, $20 million for the first year uh, committed and, and by the end of the next March. And uh, then we're off to the races and then it'll be an ongoing program with, uh, with uh, annual, annual uh, updates. So to be clear, uh, this is a three-year program. It's not a permanent program at this point, and it's $20 million per year, and you might say uh, that's not enough and that's not long enough, and I would say the best way for us to cure that together is to work with us and make sure that when I go back to Treasury Board to talk about our budget next year, in the year after that we can talk about amazing things that we did with municipalities with that $20 million a year that helped out with economic development and other things. So the better story I can tell about the great job that we did together and that you did gives me the best, better chance of having that program expanded and extended. So um, we're in this together and uh, we, were, we really want to work with you. We really want to produce some results that we can be proud of, be able to, you know, if we were in school, we would put it on the refrigerator, that, those types of things. And, and uh, so that we can, I can say to the folks in Treasury Board and my colleagues in the Cabinet and Caucus to say, this is what municipalities have accomplished with this amount of money, why wouldn't we want to extend it? So I, uh, I can't promise you today that we can, but I can promise you that together we'll have a better chance of doing that. So I look forward to working with you on uh, this new program. So, uh, what else are we talking about, whether we want to or not? Drought and wildfire. Uh, we all have to talk about it. Uh, I can assure you Alberta's government understands the gravity of the situation we're in and we're doing as much as we think we can to prepare. And that means planning and supporting local experts on the ground and pooling efforts and resources to ensure a coordinated provincial response. My colleague, Rebecca Schultz, our Environment and Protected Areas Minister and the last competent Municipal Affairs Minister you've had, um, has been tirelessly working to ensure that everything that can be done is being done. Uh, we and she and you have formed a drought command team as well as an advisory committee to be able to respond as needed. And some guy who's going to be finished in 243 days is on that committee. Thank you, President Paul. He's, uh, as I'm sure you know, all know as well as I do, he's uh, very much an expert in environmental science and water science. So he's been uh, on your behalf and as a uh, benefit to all Albertans, we're very grateful to have your president on that committee. Thank you, Paul. And, and thank you all for having that voice for rural Alberta, uh, helping guide our province in this uh, very important issue. We have uh, 
done some what we think is cutting edge modeling to help predict where assistance will be needed the most. And we are in the process of negotiating the largest water sharing agreements in Alberta's history to make every drop count. Uh, there's an old saying that I believe in that whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting. And the most fighting for water will take place when there's a shortage which might be the situation we're in right now. So we're trying to make sure that we're working together and those that have more than enough, we're trying to uh, make deals with them to share it with those that don't have enough because we we'll, either will get through this together or we won't get through this together. And the will get through is what I, where I wanna land and I'm pretty sure everybody in this room wants to land there too. So once again, it's one of those things that we are trying to do that we can't do it well and perhaps can't do it at all without you. So thank you for being part of that. On, on top of, uh, we're also investing $125 million in drought mitigation over the next five years. Now also regarding wildfire pre preparations for the upcoming wildfire season. I say upcoming, but for all intents and purposes, it started the current, let's call it the current wildfire season. Uh, preparations have been underway for months. Uh, my colleague, Minister Todd Lowen, has brought in new technologies, drones, and artificial intelligence to ensure we have pinpoint accuracy and up-to-date intelligence on wildfires. And while artificial intelligence may suck for jokes, as our president uh, has let us know this morning, um, we do think there is some applications where it can help us do planning for uh, when, where and when and fire, wildfires break out and how we uh, apply resources to those things. So we've made improvements to our wildlife prevention, preparedness, response, and mitigation efforts, and we are confident in our ability to respond to wildfires across our landscape. We will be there to support our first responders when they respond to wildfires in their communities. And uh, to be clear, we are only at the beginning of this conversation for the 2024 season. I'm sure my colleagues from the Ministries of Forestry and Parks and Public Safety and Emergency Services will have more to talk, more to share in future days. And who knows, you might even ask them questions about that when we get to the, uh, the sessions where you have ministers up here where you can ask them that. So uh, I will look forward to that. So at that point, uh, we need to hear from you about your local needs when it comes to drought and wildfires, emergency planning and response, and uh, true to form, I'm sure that you will not be shy about letting us know what's required. And uh, we uh, certainly, our government has a direct role in wildfire mitigation and response efforts in municipal affairs on your behalf, continues to play an important role. But to be clear, when those wildfires leap from the uh, forest to municipalities and, and other areas. That's where we need to work together and our government is making preparations to do that. Um, beyond that, my ministry is a uh, regular basis provides grants for firefighter training uh, with an annual investment of $500,000 and that's true again this year in the budget. Uh, we've also been reviewing fire services as part of our commitment to continual improvement and response to concerns shared by the Alberta Fire Chiefs Association and other members of the province's firefighting community. And there's probably some firefighters in the room and you will know that, uh, I don't know, it was about a couple years ago that uh, folks let me know in a unvarnished way that uh, there was things that we needed to do more of and do better. And I hope you'll agree that we have tried to address those issues. Uh, outside of the fire commissioner, we have a deputy fire commissioner who uh, uh, used to be a firefighter who's been uh, traveling the province and staying in touch with uh, fire chiefs and fire services across Alberta. And he's someone that speaks the firefighter's language and does his best to translate the firefighter's language to language that people like me that have never uh, done that job understand so that we can do the best job we can as government to try to stay in touch and provide the support that you need from us. So, well, again, we can't do that without you, and again, we'll do it better with you. Now, RMA is an important group we need to hear from as part of this review, and I know that uh, you'll be there. Uh, on surveys, uh, I want to mention the ongoing matter of uncollected oil and gas taxes. Uh, RMA has been at the lead of this issue. Um, you've been pursuing this diligently. I saw results of a survey you recently conducted and we started to see positive outcomes on the total owe, on some of the totals owed, but clearly the issue persists. Uh, RMA has brought up this repeatedly 
and we have repeatedly tried to listen. A couple years ago, we brought in Bill 7, which allowed municipalities to sue unpaid oil company, oil and gas companies for unpaid property taxes. Uh, we, the, uh, a, a, <coughs> the AER is uh, passed Directive 67, which doesn't allow companies to transfer wells or apply for new wells when they're behind on the taxes that they owe. And uh, you're probably also aware that that hasn't solved the problem. So the, and I think, I hope you will agree with me that the vast, I think you will because I've heard from a lot of you already, the vast majority of oil and gas companies are good corporate citizens. They pay their taxes, they pay their surface rights fees, they just do a good job. But there is a persistent minority, uh, mostly foreign owned oil and gas companies that just every time we do something to make it better, like anybody that doesn't want to do the right thing, they're always trying to end run us and do something else, and uh, that is still happening. Your uh, president uh, has pointed that out to us again after the last survey you've done. Um, he's, uh, and, and you gotta say, I gotta say, I know he's leaving, so I'm not even campaigning for him because he's not even running again, but I say this, your president has done a great job. Um, Now, the next fun thing, and again, I always like to say I must have done something wrong in my past life because we just struggled through the LGFF, which wasn't controversial at all, or controversial at all. but we, I think we landed mostly okay. But just, just because I was a bad person in a previous life, now we're gonna go into the assessment model review, um, which uh, we are uh, going through now. If you remember three, four years ago, we, we uh, t I would say, took a ill-thought-out, and clumsy stab at, I will say generously, trying to fix that. But because it was ill-conceived and not well thought out, it didn't fix anything. So we said, okay, and you folks convinced us that we had to back off of that. So we did, and I, th I think we, there was, might have been some trust broken, so I did the, uh, I had our ministry do, I should be embarrassed, but I'm not, because it had to be done. We did the most governmenty thing you could do. First, we consulted on how to consult because we thought we might have broke trust. So we're we're at the end of that point now. There's there's a working group that includes uh, rural Alberta uh, representation. We're done consulting on how to consult. I know it's hard to hard to even say that out loud. But now we're actually going to start consulting. So we're uh, this year we're going to we do a review of the foundational policies and principles of the assessment system including how assessable costs are determined and how values are adjusted through the uh, assessment year modifiers. We'll be working with stakeholder organizations, including RMA, of course, to ensure we get the municipal perspective right on this. And once this foundational work is complete, we will be prepared to review the assessment models after that. So that work will start basically yesterday. So we're into that now, and I think letters have gone out. People involved in it should already know, because I think the letters have gone out, and we will we'll work on that for you. Um, I think there's probably a variety of opinions in this room about how we should change the assessment model review and how we do linear assessment and stuff. I'm sure there's lots of different opinions, but the one opinion I think most people in this room probably share is this should have been uh, reviewed 20 years ago. And because I lived a bad life in a previous life, I'm doing it with you. So you can, some some point, some of you will be mad at me again when we do that. But we will honestly try to be as fair as we can we will. Uh, we are committed to including people in this room in every step of the process, so that when we get hopefully get the right thing done, if you're happy, you'll say, well. If you're happy, you're just happy. But if you're not happy, at least you'll know why you're not happy, and you'll understand what principles were applied in a reasonable way to get to a reasonable result. That's our goal, and and I would say to you the same thing I would said about LGFF. If I'm really lucky, everybody would be equally unhappy, which would be an indication we did a good job. So we have, haven't done that good job yet, but we're committed to working with you to try to get it right. Uh, a couple other things we got underway. Uh, there's some updates to the Municipal Government Act coming up um, and some of the requirements for intermunicipal collaboration frameworks. We have heard from people in this room and, and we want to hear more if there's ways that we can improve the, the rules around uh, the ICFs. Uh, then we're all ears, and if we make amendments, we want to make the amendments that you want, the ones that will work, the ones that will 
uh, create as, uh, as much harmony between you, you and your neighboring municipalities. And even if there's no harmony, allow you to get to some agreement you can both live with. So uh, again, we'll do it with you. Um, a lot of discussion, there's been some discussion uh, about political parties at the local level. And uh, as I did at Alberta municipalities last week, I'm uh, hoping I can set your mind at ease on a couple of the major points. The, uh, the first thing is, no one in this room in the next election that w doesn't want to be part of a political party will be required to. Absolutely no one will. The, the, the other piece that I think needs to be said is that we need to keep local politics local. I can assure you this is not a UCP takeover of municipal councils, It's not, and nor is it an attempt to. There will be the, whatever legislation we pass will make it very clear that anybody that decides to have a party uh, we will not be able to be affiliated with any provincial or federal party, full stop. There will be no municipal UCP party. There will be no municipal NDP party. There will be no municipal Liberal party. There will be no municipal party any at all affiliated with any provincial or federal party. So that local politics will remain local no matter what happens. So, And people may have more questions and that's fine, but I think those are the, some of the biggest concerns I heard from people. So I wanted to make sure you knew now that, those, that that just won't happen. Your, in your, the municipalities, in your, the politics in your municipality will be settled in your municipality. So we, again, we will requ we'll, uh, we're still listening to your feedback on that and uh, considering uh, how we might uh, form the rules and regulations to make them acceptable for everybody. And to be clear, there's no rule now against municipal parties. Somebody that wants to run a municipal party now can, they always have been able to. And, uh, so we're not, certainly not forcing it on anybody. If anything, I'd like to think we're probably making it harder because right now, if anybody that wanted to have a party up till now could do it and there was no rules around it. But when we're done, there will be rules around it. So you could argue with me that we're making it easier and, I, and that's a legitimate argument, which I accept. But the other argument that I'll ask you to also think about, we're actually technically making it harder to do because we're putting rules around it that didn't exist before. So before, up till now, you can do anything you want. And when we're done, you won't be able to do anything you want. So. Um, Take that as you please. Uh, housing. Some of the we're considering potential amendments to the MTA uh, with municipalities and doing other things. Uh, my minister, my uh, fellow uh, minister Jason Nixon, is the lead on provincial housing. Uh, municipal affairs, uh, on your behalf, is involved as well. Uh, I think you're going to see a pretty uh, um, robust housing strategy come forward. We also know many municipalities are already uh, with us or even ahead of us in terms of trying to reduce improvement timelines and stuff for housing, which is needed across Alberta. And we will continue to work on work with you on that so that we can, while we're attracting a more, uh, attra uh, making Alberta more attractive for businesses, we also need to make sure it's a place where people can afford to live and stay. So that's something we can't do successfully without you. And should our budget pass, which I hope it will, uh, I and Minister Nixon intend to uh, have uh, some meetings with uh, the important stakeholders, which is, yes, municipalities, yes, our government, yes, industry that builds most of the homes that get built in here so that we can all get together and say, what can we do together to get the most homes built in the shortest period of time in the most common sense way that will get allow the most Albertans, whether, whether they have high income or low income, to be able to have a place to live. And we can't do it without you. So again, we're depending upon you to, to help us be successful. And we think you'll like that because you always say, include us in everything you do. So that's our intention to do that. Um, we, will, uh, we value your input. I think the main theme of the speech has been, if I've been successful in saying it, is that the things that we do as government and as municipal affairs, we do a better job of when you're included. So uh, our intention as we go forward when we do things is to do them with you and not do them to you. Thank you.
Now, amidst the backdrop of pressing issues, including water challenges and the dissolution of smaller urban municipalities, leaders engaged directly with Alberta's cabinet ministers at the two-day conference. The quote-unquote bear pit session, which is a beacon of candid discourse, offered a platform for impassionate queries and insightful dialogue. Now, for those who are watching this via YouTube, this is an audio-only portion of the show again. But... For those who are watching this on YouTube, if you scroll down into the show notes, you can sh jump to every single question that was asked during this conference. Uh, for those who are listening to this via any of our podcast platforms, just note that this is next uh, clip is an hour and a half long. So if you like listening to municipal leaders and cabinet ministers talk like I do, then buckle in because you're in for a great ride. So... Here is day one's bear pit session between the rural municipalities of Alberta leaders and Alberta's cabinet ministers. Okay, well, thank you. I'll be brief, but uh, let me just say I'm very grateful for my colleagues to be here because I know how important it is to you, the municipal leaders, to be able to uh, get some direct accountability and ask questions directly to the ministers. Start at the back table. We got Todd Lowen, our Ministry of Forestry. And what else, Todd? I know forestry is one of the words. Forestry and parks. Uh, Matt Jones, who's our uh, uh, jet. Jobs, economy, trade. Okay. Uh, Glubish, Nate, uh, Nate Glubish, he's our IT guy. Tell me the name of your ministry. I, I know what you do, but I don't know the file. I never remember the names. We call it tech and innovation on purpose so that people wouldn't call it IT. Okay, well, see I, see, I just learned this morning that IT actually is tech and innovation. Minister Nixon, say, tell them the name of your ministry. The Seniors, Community, and Social Services. And Minister Rajan Sani. Thank you. Advanced Education. See how I did that intentionally? Because she likes it when you call her Rajan and not Rajan. Am I right? Rajan is her name. Okay. Minister Nate Glubish. Or not Nate Glubish. Nate Glubish is over here. Nate Newdorf. Uh, affordability and utilities. And the, la the last great municipal affairs minister you ever had, Rebecca Schultz. Now environment and protected areas. And the third on the uh, Nate team, playing left wing, is uh, Nate Horner. Tell them the name of your ministry, Nate. Uh, minister of Finance, President, Treasury Board. Okay, there they are, folks. Thank you for being here, too. Perfect. Thank you so much. Let's rock and roll now. So let's go to speaker number one, please. Good morning. <coughs> uh, Sandra Melzer from the MD Lesser Slave River. Uh, the government of Alberta has given 60 million extra dollars to fix aging infrastructure over three years. That is not enough to even put a dent in the needs of rural Alberta. Most of that will go to municipalities with high development. What happens to rural Alberta? We have aging infrastructure we cannot fix. The STIP funding is spread between 69 rural communities, and that is not enough to fix our aging bridge culverts, water, and utility systems. We have given, you have given away oil and gas taxes from our income, but expect us to fix our assets with less money. We have one bridge that's closed this winter at this point and will not reopen anytime soon. We have one other road that has a Bailey Bridge on it for the last three years because we need to pick and choose our projects very carefully to use our limited funding wisely. Rural Alberta is in a state of disrepair. We need more money, more funding from the provincial government. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll start with that one. Uh, that's a program that you talked about, that $60 million program. I talked about it in my remarks, and it is to help uh, municipalities that uh, have growth and, and also designed uh, for sustainability issues, and we'll put the rules around that together. Uh, if you are a municipal leader asking for more money, it only means you're good at your job. Uh, we, we, I hear that every day, and I'm not even ar I'm not arguing with you. I don't, uh, listen, we never have enough money. You never have enough money. Whatever you get from us will not be enough. Uh, but your your point is still well made. I think some of your points. Uh, if uh, I hope that uh, our transportation minister Devin Dreeshen will be here tomorrow for this session, because when you talk about local roads and bridges, that's kind of uh, only because I used to be that guy. I'm pretty sure that that's uh, in that. Uh, portfolio so now 
Minister Horner may have, I think he uh, has some news about that cause that you might like. We'll see. No, this, no news for you, Rick, but no, I did want to comment. Um, you know, when we looked at uh, Budget 2024 as a province, you know, we, we definitely understood that there wasn't, a, wasn't enough to go around to, to uh, <clears throat> you know, make, make everyone whole and fix everything on the, in, the, in the countryside. We know our infrastructure is a challenge. Uh, I have a local road, major highway thoroughfare closed right now, very close to me at home because the bridge is not only in disrepair, but they actually think it's at the point of failure. And this is, this is not uncommon. A lot of our infrastructure was built at about the same time and it's all getting old at the same time. But what we did try to do with budget 2024 was prioritize. So you've seen a priority put towards health, education, uh, housing, and in a big way, infrastructure. We've increased the capital plan by $2 billion. A lot of that will go towards uh, schools, but also highway maintenance, uh, bridges. We've put more funding into transportation. There's a, a specific line item for low volume uh, bridge bundle. So we're, we're trying to prioritize and put, uh, put the funding where it, where it makes sense and can be used. It, it'll, it'll never be enough, um, but we should also be aware that you know, the, the capital plan for the province is, uh, uh, it's, it's at a point where we, we see across Canada, there's only so much work that can be done in a, in a given year or, or period of years as well. So we're mindful that, you know, by investing more, it's, it's, it becomes even a bigger snowball that you're rolling down the hill and you're competing for the same labor that's, that's trying to build things uh, in, in, um, in private enterprise. So. I think, I think BC reprofiled 30% of their capital plan last year. We're doing better than that, but it's still, it's still an issue. Um, so we're aware of the issue. We're trying to prioritize, but there's only so much money to go around. So uh, James Hybert, County of Stetler and newly minted uh, president of ASHA. I just want to, a little bit of a good news story. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, uh, Minister Nixon. You, you did a great job on the budget. We really, really appreciate it. So I just want to say thank you for that. It, you don't get that very often, so you did a great job. We're not done yet, Rick. I wouldn't be doing my job without asking for more, but I have to say thank you when thank you's due. So there you go. Okay, so there's the guy that wants more money. <laughs> Microphone number three, please. Good morning, it's Kevin Smook from uh, Beaver County. I'm the Reba Beaver County. And my question is agricultural in nature, but really community in nature. And it's regarding ag societies and uh, the volunteers who run them. And we appreciate some of the funding that we've received collectively for capital to assist with some projects. But we're constantly seeing I believe the operating grants have been substantially the same since about 1999. And we've seen skyrocketing insurance and utilities, and they're drowning. Um, and they're coming to the municipalities to ask for help. And we're providing help where we can. But uh, we'd really appreciate it if the province would step up and assist as well and improve, uh, increase the operating grants so that they can uh, stay going. As we know, the, the uh, facilities that they operate are community hubs, very, very important to the communities. Please help. Okay. No, uh, th thanks, Kevin. Uh, it's, it's again, it's, it's one of those money issues, and it's a real one. I mean, uh, everybody uh, legitimately complains about aging infrastructure, but the, the day after you build infrastructure, it's aging. But the fact, um, it doesn't change the fact that many agricultural societies and many other uh, pieces of infrastructure in rural Alberta are not just yesterday. Some are 30, 40, 50, and 60 and more years old. So uh, we will make, 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 keep that in mind. Uh, it's, it's obviously important. And for you municipalities, we recognize that you have difficult decisions to make. Right, deciding whether to help the agricultural society or pave the road or build another park or a rec center. So uh, we're aware of the pressure you're under, and well noted uh, your support for agricultural societies. It's a, it's uh, 
agriculture, Alberta was started on agriculture, and 100 years from now, I think agriculture will be at the center of who we are. So your, your, uh, your point's well made, sir. Microphone number one, please. Uh, thank you, Jenny Melhoff, Clearwater County. Uh, my question is actually for everybody. Um, given that taxation in particular is under the authority of municipalities, Section 10 in the MGA, if you're curious, uh, and given that LGFF is um, probably 50% less than what we had asked for, if not more, again, we're asking for money, it seems to be a theme today, and given that the continued downloading of social services and emergency services, healthcare, et cetera, is continually being given to municipalities with less, what does your government do to make our communities whole again? In particular, Clearwater County took a $10 million hit from the tax holiday that your administration had uh, gifted onto municipalities. I think it's important that you mention that we are all at the table together, and I truly would like to see you make our communities whole again. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for that. Uh, I, I would say that uh, uh, Minister Ellis just put a piece of legislation on the table yesterday to, uh, we're gonna add, uh, train more police officers to assist in what's going on in your municipalities, to as assist the RCMP, assist if you're in a place with a municipal uh, police service to, uh, to help out with that. Uh, I think that, uh, let me say, the LGFF, uh, the ink's not dry on it yet, and like I said this morning, uh, that's something municipalities ask for. That's your program. Good news is that uh, it go, it, uh, it, your revenue will go up or down with municipal revenues. So we, now we're in the same boat together, which should, I think, solve not all your all what you talked about, but if you, you know, you, uh, it's, when we get more revenue, it means you'll get more revenue. I think that's a, le a legitimate step forward, and I, I will thank you for that if, uh, as much as you could thank us for that, because again, that come from municipalities, that idea. The idea came from municipalities, and the revenue index factor came from municipalities. And on the social services, I think Minister Nixon can probably uh, let you know, I think he's doing quite a bit of work there in, in, uh, in the social services and housing in your in municipalities across Alberta. Well, I can't speak for how Rick's going to get you more money, but I can tell you that uh, we, we're, we're doing our part in the Alberta government when it comes to social services. I mean, five and a half billion dollar operating budget that my department runs is not a small thing for the Alberta taxpayers to be investing in a lot of different important issues. As was just alluded to, probably the best affordable housing budget in the history of the province. And we continue to make sure that we're investing strategically across the province to be able to help meet uh, met all the different obligations, the pressures that are on uh, the department. But I, I do also want to say that we recognize that we can't do that without our municipal partners and our, uh, our nonprofit partners. You know, we're seeing record amounts of houses built, the most in the history of our country right now. And that's because all levels of government are working together and we're putting politics aside and getting it done. So I want to assure you that's going to continue and we're going to continue to see some big results for our province when it comes to social services over the next 12 months. And Minister Nixon's a little modest. He didn't mention that we've indexed Ace and a bunch of the other social services, which if you talk about downloading, it's, this, is, this is the opposite of downloading. Hopefully it'll allow people on those services to uh, more keep up than they have been in the past with the automatic indexing of many of the social services programs. What Rick said. Microphone, two. Microphone number Microphone two, please. Two. Brent Reese, Northern Lights. Um, 2011, Crown Corporation, Atomic Energy of Canada Limited was sold to Prime Minister's special friends, SNC-Lavalin. They were the only bidder. They were actually paid to take it. With it right, came rights to the Candu reactor technology. Acton's Realis is what SNC-Lavalin calls himself now. And they're the crookedest engineering company in the world. And they'd like to sell us some reactors. Here's what they've been convicted of. Bribery, conspiracy to commit bribery, fraud, conspiracy to commit fraud, bid rigging. They were banned for five years in Quebec for ripping off municipalities there. They were banned for 10 years by the World Bank, and they would have been banned for 10 years by the federal government here. But, of course, they're the Prime Minister's special friends, and an honest justice minister had to go instead. So can someone from Cabinet give us some assurance that common sense will prevail here and treat those special engineering friends who won't get their grubby hands on public money in this province? Okay, well, 
L let me say this, that we are in favor of uh, uh, looking at uh, alternative ways to get more base load on the grid, in uh, including uh, potential nuclear reactors, uh, small and medium nuclear reactors to get uh, uh, more base load, more distributed uh, production of electricity. Uh, you talked about uh, the company that you uh, uh, described in a, uh, a very detailed way that they uh, have saw one particular piece of technology for the can-do reactors, so I guess we'll have to work uh, to see what we can, if there's an, other technologies, or we may end up having, if, we, if that's the technology we need, we'll just have to try to make sure that if any business gets done, that we do it in a way that's above board and uh, where we can demonstrate value to Alberta taxpayers. I don't know if any of my colleagues, uh, Minister Newdorf, looks like he wants to speak to this as well. Yeah, thanks, uh, Minister McIver. Uh, great question. We in Alberta are very, very proud of our private industry, and we will do everything we can to make sure that we protect uh, the integrity of that system. Uh, if there are public monies being put forward for additional generation, we will make sure that it is absolutely transparent and uh, free, a free market enterprise and clear competition will be brought forward to that. I look forward to maybe talking with you a little bit further offline. But uh, we are very aware of, of some of the history of, of some of these uh, entities. But in Alberta, we've got a lot of, of great companies moving forward on their own investment dollars. And we want to make sure that they have every opportunity to do that. So thanks, for, thanks again for your comments. Uh, it takes us to microphone three. Kelly Nelson, Vulcan County. Um, I was wondering why there was no increase to FCSS funding while asking FCSS to take on more from other ministries like health, mental health, transportation, and senior supports. We got a 5% increase last year, and have, we had no increase in the past for quite a few years, and this was not enough to cover the extras that we are asking to be providing. We really appreciate the work FCSS does. Let me first start off by saying that and we recognize the value of it which is why we increased the budget last year and why we have maintained the budget this year uh, the reality is the finance minister will tell you is we also have some tough fiscal circumstances to be able to make sure the budget was still balanced uh, and we were dealing with uh, significant statutory requirements with some of the decisions the right decisions to index things like age uh, as well as to be able to increase things like seniors benefits uh, in the significant investment that we have to do in housing and other important social programs. And so uh, the best spot we could find at the moment for FCSS was a flat budget, uh, but uh, that does not uh, reflect the value that we put in the work that the organization uh, does across the province, uh, but is a reflection of what it takes to be able to be, meet our fiscal obligations while meeting our social obligations across the province. Perfect. Thank you for the question. Microphone number one, please. Offer. I'd like to uh, discuss fresh water uh, as it flows in Alberta. Could, could you say your name Brad and municipality? Pearson, Lester, it, Brad Pearson, Lester Slave River, sorry. Um, discussing water as it flows in a diminished capacity with the uh, drought conditions that we're to experience. Um, my question would be to uh, agriculture and irrigation, but seeing not here, uh, maybe uh, Honorable Rebecca Schultz can answer on, the, on behalf of the environment. Um, questions I have are... Uh, surrounded around the allocation of uh, water licenses and how they will um, be diminished or, uh, you know, handled in a declining water flow. Um, how will these licenses be, be curtailed on an equitable basis, I'm hoping? And um, lastly, um, will there be basin-to-basin -basin transfers um, that will uh, uh, be entertained and how will they be managed appropriately? Thank you. Awesome. I, I was predicting a couple of questions on water and I'm glad that you raised it. And I know, uh, I'm sure RJ will be here tomorrow. And so he may give you uh, a slightly more egg uh, focused response, but we are working really closely with agriculture and irrigation uh, on what uh, needs to be done. I think it's two things. We separate the work into two different uh, buckets, if you will. One is how do we get through this growing season, making sure that all users uh, within our system have access to some water. So I would say early in April, we're gonna have some announcements uh, that will uh, really, I think, update Albertans on where those water sharing agreements uh, are at. This will be the largest water sharing agreement discussion in Alberta's history, just given the situation that we're in right now. Um, last time we were in a situation like this, 2001, 
Um, same thing, we took a collaborative approach. We don't want to be the government coming in and starting to dictate uh, water uses and licenses. And so this collaborative approach, everybody's coming to the table to say, look, how can we all conserve some water? How do we reallocate that additional water within the system to make sure that all users have access to some? Of course, while priority uh, uses would be human and animal health. Um, and, and so I think that that's typically what we see not only here, but across the country. It's not just Alberta that's in this drought, but we did take swift action early on. You all uh, would know we sent a letter to municipalities before the holidays uh, asking to take a look at your water use, your water consumption. Um, and you know we've also reached out to all of our major industries. So those discussions are going well. We have a water advisory panel that's bringing suggestions forward. Um, Paul is on that. Uh, I'm very, very grateful, Paul, for your expertise. Every time I'm in those meetings, I just think, man, we picked the right group of people. Um, and so you've got a great advocate uh, for rural Alberta uh, in Paul and bringing forward some of the ideas that all of you may be sharing on how we could better use and allocate water. Um, when it comes to specifics, you're right. Uh, you asked specifically about interbasin transfer. Uh, we have been asked to look into that. We've done it in the past, specifically for drinking water. Uh, that would typically be uh, what my department would call a lower risk transfer. Uh, it, it does come up all of the time. It came up a, a lot around irrigation for me uh, and how we can take water. You know, oftentimes people will say, can we not take water from Northern Alberta uh, where we have lots to where the people are in Southern Alberta. Uh, there's a few things that we would have to do before we could look at anything like that. There might be ways uh, that we could look at that, but we've got to make sure, uh, A, that those areas are also, we'd have to consult with local residents and communities and municipalities uh, to make sure that your water needs are being met. Uh, we, of course, would have to look at uh, aquatic impacts. So if certain fish or creatures live in one uh, basin and would not survive in another, that's something that we also have to look at. Um, but it is one of the things that's been recommended. We're looking at all options. Uh, for what may happen, and then that bigger picture, sorry, I don't have a timer, but it's actually good uh, because it takes a little bit of time to, to explain this. So the first is that immediate get us through the fall. The second is that bigger question that you asked about with just overall water allocations. Um, I don't think that creating panic and telling people, you know, we're gonna throw it all out and start from scratch, that's not what we need to do right now, especially in a situation that we're in right now. But we do have to look at uh, sometimes some of those larger, more historical license. There just hasn't been a need for conservation, quite frankly. We gotta look at that. If there's additional water in the system, you know, Premier has asked me to maximize our water allocation so that communities can grow and our industries can grow along with our population growth. Uh, so that is exactly what we're looking at. And I, I think the discussions that we're having over the next few months will help us with the bigger picture. Uh, there will be regulatory changes, I would say. You can expect some of those this spring on the things that we can change a little bit uh, faster. I would imagine there will be legislative changes and more regulatory changes coming in the fall. But if you have suggestions, um, again, I mean, you can come directly to me and my department. Uh, we'd love to hear it. We are looking at uh, all, all industries, all types of recommendations on both how we can reuse water, how we can treat allocations, how we can make sure that, uh, again, we can, we can grow sustainably with the water we have. You can also share that information with Paul um, and he can bring it to us as well. So um, more to come, I would say. I, I've been telling the department plan for an announcement the first week of April, so it might actually be second week of April. That's how this typically works. Um, but you know what, um, I am grateful for, for all of you being flexible and at the table and willing to have those discussions so that we can get through the next couple of months with everybody having access to water. Okay, and that takes us to microphone two. Good morning, my name is Punky Banjoko from Regional Municipality of Wood Buffalo, Councillor. Um, my question is to Minister Nixon. Minister, we have, ha we have some concerns uh, about the reduction of funding from both the federal and provincial government to combat homelessness. Uh, this year alone, we've had to go into our reserves to meet the needs in our region. Minister, I would like to know if you have some plans and what plans you have to help us combat homelessness. More, many more people have be, are becoming homeless, as we all know, the time is harsh. My second question is, uh, is to 
Minister Matt and is about child care. Um, I know that portfolio has moved to you now. What are we doing? Are we going to get COLA back to those workers so that we can retain the child care workers? Thank you. Well, I'll take homelessness. Uh, we, we've actually increased our investment in the homeless file to the most in Alberta history by a lot. We will spend a little over $100 million. We spent a little over $100 million the last fiscal year, and we'll be a little bit more than that in this upcoming fiscal year. A lot of that challenge has been predominantly uh, focused on the large cities, the seven largest cities, which would include <clears throat> your municipality uh, because of Fort McMurray. Uh, and you've seen some of it, what's been taking place here in Edmonton in the news as we've worked to take down encampments. I suspect everybody that is here for RMA will probably have noticed that the city looks a heck of a lot different than the, la different than the last time that you were here. And that's because we put together a navigation center with full wraparound supports to be able to support law enforcement to dismantle, those navig dismantle the encampments while making sure we get support for the homeless. And we learn a lot from that. Uh, over the last uh, several months, and we intend to be able to take those lessons to other communities, including yours. So we'll be in touch shortly about some of the ideas that we have for your areas. The further we get from the largest cities, the more unique it'll be just as far as distance to resources. But the point of that wraparound service is getting help into those communities and helping those individuals uh, still stands. And I know somebody that works for me is on their way to you right now to give you a card so we can reach out for more specifics about what's happening in your municipality. The councilor also asked about provincial and federal money. Now, Minister Nixon uh, has been working hard with the federal counterpart. About four weeks ago, the federal minister came through Alberta and left $200 million a year. We're very grateful for that. But then the next day, he went to BC, who has the same population, and gave him $2 billion, 10 times as much. Now, in fairness, Minister Nixon, I think, has been working real hard with that minister, and we're making some ground, but that's also, we're making efforts on your behalf to kind of deal with, the, with our, our federal brothers and sisters. And I think... Yeah, if you, when you talk to your MP and anybody from Ottawa, you make clear that we expect per capita funding when it comes to homelessness and housing as well. Uh, full stop. And we're not going to stop until we get it. We've seen it in the largest cities right now, to Minister McIver's point, with the latest $200 million announcement. But we need to make sure Justin Trudeau and the federal government realize there's a whole world outside of Edmonton and Calgary and we expect it to be funded. Yeah, the rural municipalities won't see much till we're successful, I don't think. Matt? Thank you. On child care... Um some good news, we've increased our ability to <clears throat> produce early childhood educators by about 33% over three years. In other words, our pipeline is 33% larger. We've seen a 47% increase in ECEs across Alberta, 8,500 more ECEs, and they're more educated than before, which means there's more level twos and level threes, uh, which means they receive higher wages because, of course, the province has a wage top-up program in place. Going forward to address your concerns, we're doing work on what's called the cost control fra framework. And what that is, is it's a regional analysis to determine what is reasonable cost of delivering high quality childcare and labor is a big component of that. And we recognize it's going to require different amounts in different areas of the province to attract people to work in a sector. So I hear you. And certainly that's part of the calibration of the future cost control framework, which I hope to roll out later this year. <clears throat> Microphone number three. Morning, Jean Haravik, Beaver County. Uh, this is out to Minister Nixon and Minister Horner. First off, thank you for forwarding funding changes for our seniors. It's been a long time coming. The Lodge Review is key to rural, and I think we were short for representation from rural Alberta. It seemed that most of the representation was from the large city corridor, and I know that we had Paul on there, and I know that he's speaking long and strong for us. Going into the continuing care is going to be the key to supporting our seniors in rural Alberta. I was excited to hear the presentation uh, from the ADM at our ASHA conference. And my request and hope is that every MLA, doesn't matter of what party in the ledge, gets to hear that presentation in the same room at the same time. This is the time that we can do the change. We know that as a bilateral partisan group, that you guys can support, and let's take the politics out of supporting and fixing our health for our seniors and people in need. We know that it's got to get fixed. Well, thank you for the question, and I completely agree with you. I mean, when it comes to the health reform that we are working on as a government, I think the most important area is continuing care. If we get that right, everything else will come together, primary care, acute care, uh, as well as mental health and addictions, the other three components of that health reform. 
Uh, and we aren't going to stop till we get it right because we have to have uh, people that need continuing care in our province receive appropriate services. And I also want to be clear, as a rural Albertan, that means that they will receive appropriate services in the communities that they want to live in, the communities that they built. So that's step one. And we, I, I do agree with you. I don't think it's a partisan issue. It, this is about caring for the people that built, for our, built our province. Uh, as for uh, the Lodge Review, it's long overdue. The, the Lodge program is our most, our, our oldest affordable housing program in the province. It's critical. The more rural you get, the more critical it is. Uh, but it was, it was time to have a conversation about a decade-old program, about things that we need to change to be able to make sure that it will work for the future and be here for the next generation. Uh, and I really appreciate everybody who's taking the time to do that. Anybody who's interested in it, please reach out to that review process, make sure you get your input into it so that we can make sure that we get it right. Uh, we've already heard some of the stuff that we've heard early on in this process around capital maintenance in particular that you've already seen the government do. I mean, I raised the capital maintenance and renewal budget on this issue to $115 million, I think, at the moment, which is significantly more than it was in the past, which is bringing on hundreds and hundreds of more units uh, that would have been coming offline in our communities inside some of our aging infrastructure. So that's just one example of what we're learning from that process. So it's valuable, and I really encourage everybody to continue to uh, participate in it to, and to know that you are being heard because you see changes coming as a result of that input. Great. Thank you for your answer, Minister. Microphone number one, please. Greg Harris, Mountain View County, for Minister Scholes. Um, I wonder if you could give us an update on the EPR program and when we might see some funding trickling down, especially municipalities running our own landfills. And I guess a bit of a part two is we recently, uh, last year, stopped taking recycl certain recyclables because we were simply watching them go into a recycle bin, company pick it up, drive it to our landfill and dump it in. Um, there, there's a gap in the process here. It's profit driven and they just do whatever makes them the most money. I would say thank you so much for the question. So EPR, uh, we are rolling out still on schedule. Uh, I would say that, and of course I wasn't the minister responsible when we, when we brought those regulations in, but there were uh, uh, parameters around how that program works to uh, essentially require nonprofits remove some of the potential, uh, whether real or perceived, conflicts of interest, um, and making it about or ensuring that it is about a public service and, and not necessarily for profits. Um, but that said, if, if there is an example of that, uh, and I tell people this, whether it's on EPR or it's on water or, you know, my department giving you a headache over a wetland or anything like that, um, I, you know, I often joke that we hear about it at forums like this, but bring those specific examples to us so that we can dig into them right away. Uh, and so uh, in terms of, of where we're at, we're still ro rolling out. We're grateful of the support um, of municipalities as we move forward. Mostly we get good feedback uh, about EPR. We did make, I, I've only made one change to, to those regulations, um, and that was really to exempt uh, smaller newspapers, quite frankly. They reached out and said, look, we're going to shut, we can't afford rural newspapers, for example. Uh, at a time when our federal government is censoring media online, I thought that was not the time uh, to, to put this additional burden on rural newspapers. So that would be most of the people that you would represent. Uh, and so I, I don't know if I formally announced that yet, but here you are. It's coming this spring. Uh, changes to come. I, I just I feel really strongly about rural Alberta and communities having access uh, to local media. So um, that is the only change that I've made to EPR uh, specifically in terms of regulation since coming into this role. I think it'll be a welcome one. But as for the rest of it, um, we're still moving ahead on time, uh, on schedule, and grateful for your feedback on that. But like I said, if there's a specific instance um, that we need to dig into, please reach out to me. And we do have staff here as well. I'm sure they can come over, find you, um, and get your card, and we can connect over that, and I'll get you a, a more specific answer. Okay. And off to microphone two. Uh, Jackie Watts, Starland County. My question is for Municipal Affairs. Uh, currently, I'd like to know when and if you guys are going to do a deep dive on small municipalities, 500 or less. Several are dissolving and they're dumping huge burdens on the rural counties and MDs. Currently, we have one going through it. It's an infrastructure deficit of 10 million. They have 400,000 in debt and we're told we'll have to onboard or severance their employees. Currently, after this year, we'll write off another 2 million in taxes from unpaid oil and gas which will total 14 million. 
our budget is 14 million. So if we get this dissolution, we will not be viable and we have not been consulted properly through this process and it needs to change. Okay. Well, that is, uh, that is a timely question. Uh, we have discussions about that on a regular basis. Usually, uh, a lot of times it's around when you know, we talk to municipal or rural municipalities. Uh, I know I talk to a number of rural municipalities that tell me, and there's probably a bunch in this room, that they have small, we'll call them urbans, within their uh, rural municipality, that a lot of uh, rurals are given money every year to the small urban municipality to keep it alive because that's cheaper than have it go under. That's uh, right. Yeah, okay, you're not. See, you're not in your head. It was be surprised if you weren't. So, we've always said we don't want to force dissolutions, but when but we do have the uh, several measurement indexes, including the municipal measurement index, which is on our website, which some of you like better than others. But we uh, through municipal affairs, we we do keep track. We have uh, indicators of when a municipality may be in trouble and we go and talk to them and look at them and if it seems like there is issues then we we uh, do uh, more things to try to either help them along or do things to try to come to a conclusion whether they can uh, make it or not. So if you're telling me this is a live issue, uh, I, I don't disagree with you. I, again, we're reticent to force dissolutions, but I think your first words was, are we gonna do a deep dive? We look regularly. Uh, and again, we follow these indicators every year. Uh, perhaps you're saying we should look more regularly than that, and I promise you I'll have a discussion with my staff within my department about that. Uh, I, I've often said uh, in front of this room and in front of Alberta municipalities as well, that with 330 municipalities in Alberta and a population of about 4.5 million, that's, that's a lot too many municipalities compared to what we might have. On the other hand, I've always said, who am I to tell people how to spend their money if they want to pay for their own mayor or even council in their municipality? But as you rightly point out, they need to be able to fulfill the basic obligations of a municipality. So um, I, I think we're actively doing this, but because you prompted me, I'm going to promise you we're going to take a harder look at that to see whether the uh, uh, regular basis we look at this is enough. Uh, again, you used the word deep dive, and I think that's a... Again, we don't want to pick on anybody, but we need to not be surprised and have you less surprised than you seem to have been uh, through no fault of your own. Yeah, thank you, Mr. I'm going to take advantage because there's the last question was related to unpaid taxes. And, and you guys have probably heard me a couple times. I'm not happy about unpaid taxes. I've said a few things. Um, and so, uh, Brian Jean, Minister Jean, isn't going to be here in the next couple days. But you, you, the AER is an agent of the Crown, and this is cabinet here. So we've never had political theater here before. So if everybody can grab your pom-poms and just wave your pom-poms, just do shake. Yay. Everybody do it. Everybody bring oh. your pom-poms. Yay. Yeah. Uh, those are the ones they never waved when I was giving my speech this morning. I'm just that's, pointing that's that out. Right. Stop. Be a regulator. <laughs> a little bit of political theater. Thank you. Microphone number three, please. Murray Phillips, uh, County of Two Hills. Uh, rural health uh, hospitals are facing uh, labor shortages uh, across the whole province here. Um, we do have lots of temporary nurses, uh, travel nurses, staffing, helping out all over. The big problem that we're seeing and uh, I'd like the government to help out with is the amount of rural seats in universities and colleges. Uh, the U of A, Nate, everything, all their enrollment, especially like for our situation, it's our lab x-ray, there's like 38 seats. How many of those are rural? If they're not from rural, they're not coming back. They're higher paid positions, applicant rate was over 400. The same goes to doctors, nurses, any staff within a hospital. We need to look at, we are funding the universities. We need more rural seats in them so they'll come back to our communities. Okay, thank you for that question. And first of all, it's uh, great to be here. Thank you for the invitation to join you all. Really important series of questions that you've asked. And uh, so first I'm going to talk about our regional health training centers. We have 
uh, line items in the budget, and it was announced in Budget 2023, but we've invested as well. And this investment is all about creating more rural seats for medical students in Grand Prairie and Lethbridge and the surrounding areas to begin with. So that work is underway. I was just meeting with the uh, Dean of the Med School at U of A yesterday just to get some progress on this, and I'm actually going to try to accelerate it because it is one way that we can create more seats for physicians. Now, I also had the opportunity to speak to uh, Mayor Gerald Aubers, actually. He got me the other day at Alberta Municipalities, and he brought up exactly what you said about lab and x-ray technicians. So I immediately texted my deputy minister and said, let's get on this. Normally, how we fund uh, seats for certain occupations is that we look at the Alberta Occupational Outlook Report that does this vast study on what the labor market demand is. And so I'm going to go back and look at that, but I think it's really important to actually engage with communities as well to see where these shortages are. So I am on that. I got that message loud and clear. And uh, please stay tuned. There will be an announcement about uh, some of the investments that we're doing to create these regional health training centers, which will allow for more seats for residencies as well. And uh, it's exciting news, and it's going to be a game changer for rural communities. We're finally going to get students who are going to be training in the community, and the data and research shows that when students train and study in a community, that they will stay there. So that's the focus of, of my work around workforce development for the next couple of years. But thank you for that question. Always happy to provide more info. Just to add on to that, I got told it, they accepted 38 seats. There was over 400 applicants to that, and eight seats were bought by BC. So that's a pretty low number when we're looking at lab x-ray shortages across Canada. And there's only two schools for lab x-ray in Canada. Yeah, and I'm going to look into that. And sadly, that is a story amongst several occupations, not just for lab x-ray technicians. But like I said, I'm on it. Thank you. OK, microphone number one. Good morning. Ooh, I was too loud here. Um, so Amber Bean, I'm Reeve of Querols County, and my question is for Minister Lowen. So last month uh, you attended Growing the North Conference in Grand Prairie, and you'd mentioned that the province is committed to a bunch of new campgrounds and millions to support that. So just wondering if you can elaborate a little bit on where those will be created, and if the North when I say north, I don't mean Edmonton north. I mean north of, uh, you know, the Dunvegan Bridge, where the mighty Peace River is. Um, if any of those areas will see some of those allocations and funding. Okay, thanks very much, Amber. And I, I just want to point out that my, my son is over there on, uh, on the soundboard there. And I told him if, we got, if I had any tough questions to cut the mic. And cut the mic. No, go ahead. Thanks, thanks, Amber. Appreciate that question. Um, no, so we do have the plan to do 900 campsites, and uh, we actually believe that uh, we're going to be able to exceed that. And there is going to be some in northern Alberta, and, uh, and I, I agree that uh, northern Alberta isn't just north of Edmonton, that it's actually north of the Peace River too. And so we're, we are looking at, uh, uh, still looking at plans, and still looking at, at, looking at locations. And we do want to make sure that we spend that money where it's needed, where there's uh, a, a need for camping and campsites. So I would look forward to hearing any input that you have within the municipality there and any of the municipalities in the north, because we do want to make sure that we cover the province with those, uh, with those campsites and make sure that uh, we, know, we know that a lot of people want to visit, uh, you know, the Kananaskis area, the area, you know, the mountain parks and those areas. But we also know there's a lot of great places in uh, northern, southern, eastern and western parts of Alberta that, uh, that are very beautiful, that uh, people could enjoy. And again, we just have to, ha we have, to have places for people to go to and, uh, and have an enjoyable experience for them so that they go back and they tell their friends too. So, so I appreciate that for sure, but we will be looking all across the province for that project. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Minister. Microphone number two, please. <clears throat> Good morning. Arno Dirksen from the County of Newell. Uh, late last week, the Canadian Sustainability Standards Board released their sustainability standards document for consultation. It's open for comment until this June the 10th. It's a pretty short time window. This is, this is very closely aligned with the International Sustainability Standards Board, which is a European initiative. And if left in that in that frame, it's going to be very difficult on most Canadian Alberta industries, agriculture, oil and gas. This is, it's been called the, the largest uh, 
um, accounting exercise since double entry accounting was introduced in the 15th century. For lack of a better strategy, I think we need the Alberta government could, could, could help us push that consultation back till we know how the U.S. is going to deal with that. They're our largest trading partner and if we misalign ourselves with the Americans, we're going to be in trouble. I think we need some immediate action on this to find a good strategy to... Okay, uh, I'm going to... Okay, I'll, I'll go to right to uh, Minister Horner. Go ahead. Yeah, I appreciate the question, Arno. It's it's pretty fresh information for us too. Uh, even the the department uh, wasn't wasn't aware until uh, uh, very recently. So we're we're looking into it. There may be a, a ability for Alberta to uh, to comment um, as as a province. Would encourage uh, municipalities, people that are aware and concerned, to comment as well. Um, I'm, I'm unsure, um, I, I understand that you've heard from speakers that are very concerned about sectors like agriculture specifically and what this could mean. So I would just advise that as we all become aware, um, join the consultation, make your comments known. And if there's a place that Alberta can uh, provide a, a push, uh, we, we certainly will. Uh, but honestly, we, we don't really know what this entails yet either. So I, I know as much as you do. Or, or maybe less. Sorry, Arno. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. And that takes us to microphone three. I want to thank everyone for coming out today and doing this for us. My name is Glenn Gunderson. I'm from Brazoo County. My question is to the Minister, Rebecca Schultz, and it involves geoengineering. Um, this is the practice of putting millions of tons of sulfuric acid into the atmosphere to shade the planet for climate reduction to bring that temperature down a degree. I'd like to see some rules put in place, regulations. I know that Calgary University is doing that now, but either put a pause on the practice or get some better regulations. Um, Mexico banned the practice last year after finding that companies were doing it here. Premier v Bill Van Der Zalm, he did a FOIP and he found all sorts of, he had documents basically showing that Canada's doing it, but we don't know how much and what it's impacting. It can impact the, the weather, drought, and it makes fires worse. We know that by dropping aluminum on trees, it just makes them into super fire tornadoes. It's, it's affecting us. So I'm just looking for some direction from the government. Yeah, that's a, a good question. And I think um, that's something that we do work on. I know uh, all jokes aside about the regulator, but we do work closely uh, just when it comes to measurement and different regulations and practices for especially the industry energy industry. We work closely on that with uh, both energy and minerals and of course uh, our regulator. Um, you know, I, I do just want to take a minute to brag a little bit. Over the last year, you know, we get a lot of heat, I think, um, especially from our federal friends, our federal government, uh, about our major industries. And we're actually doing a really great job across the board. Um, I got to talk a little bit about methane emissions reduction. Um, the great work that our energy industry is doing, how we hit our, our targets on time, actually ahead of time, uh, three years ahead of time for less cost. But there's always, of course, more work uh, that needs to be done. Uh, I wasn't in this position when we rolled out our emissions reduction and energy development plan, but that work continues. And if there are regulations that need to change, um, I mean, bring those recommendations forward for us specifically to look at. Um, but I am really proud on our leadership uh, overall. Uh, when it comes to to energy and uh, to our work on climate and emissions reduction, and uh, please keep those uh, submissions coming coming forward. Perfect. Microphone number one, one please. Good morning. My name is Rob Weedman from Parkland County. I'm a councillor. Uh, the government of Alberta is establishing a police uh, advisory board to represent 290 municipalities who fall under the provincial police funding agreement. Will a localized, a more localized structure be considered where there are uh, committees established at a local level? And I guess I'll give you an example. There's Parkland County, Spruce Grove and Stony Plain. The, uh, Spruce Grove and Stony Plain come under a different agreement. So for us to not be part of their localized policing agreement doesn't make any sense. And for us to be under 290 other municipalities, I'm sure we'll have no input there at all. Thank you. Okay, this is a... Uh 
Thank you for this. This is a, a Minister Ellis question. I don't know if he's going to be here tomorrow or not. I, I hope so. Uh, it seems to me that he's open to that. I only say that not because I know, because I heard him answer the question in question period yesterday. <laughs> and my memory is a little imperfect, but I think he said he's open to that. But if, yeah, he did. Okay, I'm getting the nod from some of my colleagues here. So uh, he's aware that uh, having... 290 municipalities may not be adequate civilian oversight for local policing issues. So uh, I would encourage you to well, contact us and we'll pass it on. We will pass it on to Minister Ellis because you asked here, but I will also uh, recommend you go straight to his ministry as well, not one or the other, but both, and we will try to get you a more detailed answer than what I am able to furnish you right now. Yeah, Minister Ellis is here tomorrow too as well. Okay. Microphone number two, please. Uh, good morning, Dan Bovere from Northern Sunrise County. Uh, question for Minister Horner. Uh, since 2019, the AGLC has been reviewing charitable gaming, uh, completing it in 2021. Um, the distribution of casino funds throughout rural Alberta has not been equitable for decades. Uh, at, the con at this conference last spring, uh, Premier Smith said it right when she was asked a question. It's not about reducing urban clubs, but bringing up rurals to be equitable. Minister Horner, is this the year you will instruct AGLC to fix this problem? Well, this is the year I'm gonna instruct Mr. Nally to fix the problem, because AGLC is under his, his file, but uh, I, I know he's working on this. I, I do believe he's going to be here tomorrow, so I, I would suggest you, you ask him this question. But I've I've heard the same commentary from from the premier, uh, so I hope I hope it is uh, a change that's made. I I really can't uh, comment on where where he's at, but I, I know he's I know he's heard the call, and I assume that the work's being done. Okay, microphone three. Good morning. This question is for Minister Schultz. Last week, the Saskatchewan Rural Municipalities voted around 95% in favor that CO2 is not a pollutant. CO2 is a vital component of our atmosphere, and records show that the current levels of CO2 in our atmosphere are much lower than earlier in history. However, the federal government is very focused on increasing taxation for carbon. Perhaps a similar resolution of that as Saskatchewan should have come to RMA today. But my question is this, how do we get to where we can move the narrative to that kind of discussion in Alberta? Thank you. And I will not let you go until you say your name in municipality. I am so sorry. Holly Johnson, County of Newell. Thank you, Holly. Thank you so much for that question. And I, I mean, I'll be honest, when we talk, and, and somebody has raised this with me, and I, I just was digging into uh, the resolution in Saskatchewan just to see what the wording was. Um, we work very closely with Saskatchewan, especially when it comes to defending our provinces against uh, completely unreasonable, unrealistic, and uh, I would just say totally ideological policies out of the federal government. Um, I'm going to try to keep this one short because I could probably rant about the federal government uh, and for the next hour, but it is frustrating because the narrative that they're putting forward doesn't actually make sense. The carbon taxes are not reducing emissions. What we've been doing in Alberta, and yes, you're exactly, I get, I get letters every day. In fact, I read one this morning and it was about, uh, you know, does the federal government understand that CO2 is, is required for photosynthesis and that, you know, our forests and our grasslands uh, also play a very important role in reducing emissions. Um, we have really been clear about essentially defining this on our own terms. And that's really, I think, why when Minister Savage formally brought forward our emissions reduction and energy development plan, I know one of the reasons why she felt so passionately about it is because enough is enough with the federal government defining uh, our actions, our leadership, and, and essentially choosing ideology over common sense. So when we look at, you're exactly right, taxation, um, we don't view that as the solution here. We are leading the way. And even when we were at COP, we, we had people uh, talking about the great work that we were doing, whether it is in uh, carbon capture, utilization, storage, methane emissions reduction, the federal government doesn't ever give 
any credit to Alberta and our industries for the work that we've been doing. And, you know, I know linked with that is the conversation about how do we define net zero. I actually think that Stephen Guibo and our federal liberal counterparts, when they talk about net zero, they mean zero. They mean that they want to shut down all of our major industries. And I think the question that I often hear uh, from Albertans and from Canadians right now is where is this discussion around safe, reliable, affordable energy and electricity? That matters, right? When, when we make up such a small portion of global emissions, we could shut down all of our major industries and it wouldn't have an impact as obviously development, I, I mean, we talk a lot about coal, but um, I would say less environmentally friendly forms of energy in China and India continue to rise. People expect that we are going to lift people out of energy poverty around the world, and we expect a standard of living here. So, uh, you know, I think how the federal government defines it and the narrative that we use to talk about uh, our work on emissions reduction, we are, in fact, leading the way in a way that still prioritizes safe, affordable, reliable energy. And I actually think the answer, you know, if, if the feds are out there talking about zero, which I, I do believe Minister Givo means zero. When I look at, you know, our plans to 2050, we are actually the answer to, to global emissions reduction. If we are seeing per barrel, and we are seeing per barrel uh, emissions going down, uh, 21 to 23 percent, I think, per barrel emissions have gone down in the oil sands, our methane emissions reduction. Uh, we hit our target, like I said, 45 percent, three years ahead of schedule for $600 million less cost to industry than if we had done it the way the feds would do it. We should then be producing more to meet what the world needs. That, I, I believe, is how neutrality works, but how we define it, how the feds define it, two very different things. Sorry, I'm talking too much now. Um, but I'm really passionate about this, and so I know the Premier is too, and I'm very grateful for the question, because I think you're right. I think, you know, um, this is the opportunity that we have to come together, and, and I would say, on things like clean electricity, and an oil and gas emissions cap, and the new methane cap, and like, think about that. The federal government, the, the federal minister, we were in COP, two days before he announced an oil and gas emissions cap and he wouldn't give me any details about it because I didn't sign an NDA. I said to him, with all due respect, if this was a constructive federalism, we wouldn't have to sign an NDA to talk to you about policy that's going to impact areas of provincial jurisdiction. It was, it was hot over there, but that room was heated. I was not impressed. And so, honestly, that is why I think we've been successful at starting to see the narrative change uh, because, you know, myself, Minister Newdorf, Minister Jean, we've actually just been working directly with municipalities, with business groups, with industry and saying, look, enough is enough. We need to, to come together to align, to put forward, uh, you know, is exactly why these Technically speaking, the federal regulations aren't working. Um, it's why we launched that Tell the Feds campaign about electricity. Like, enough is enough with the federal narrative. It is completely devoid of reality, the reality that Albertans and Canadians are facing every single day from a jobs perspective, from an economic perspective, and from a safe, reliable, affordable energy perspective. So that's my soapbox. Thank you for the question, and, and I do think that we have even more of an opportunity to partner with municipalities because, quite frankly, um, this oil and gas cap, I mean, you know, I've, I've, I know I'm meeting with the County of Newell later today. I've already talked to two of your members today. I mean, this, this has a very real impact on rural Alberta and on communities and on our way of life and on our ability to fund basic um, supports that people rely on from social services to healthcare and education. So uh, we're going to continue to advocate and, and build our own narrative and drive that moving forward. And I, and I honestly think it's working. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Minister. In, in, uh, as all the members know, in RMA language, that's a rant. Uh, and RMA <laughs> likes rants, do you not? <laughs> Big round of applause for the Minister. Yeah, who thinks everybody in Canada should hear what we just heard? Microphone one.
Good morning, Karina Williams, Northern Sunrise County. Minister Schultz, I loved your rant. So um, my question for you is, will you consider allowing municipalities to use wastewater as an option at the times when we are required to do dust control on gravel roads? Obviously, this is very selective, knowing the drought that's coming up. However, the red tape at present does restrict us from doing that. And is this something you'll consider looking at? Uh, yes, and so thank you for the question. I thought you were gonna ask me about BC and our agreements with BC and Site C, but if anybody else wants that one, uh, I can answer that later. But um, no, you know what, this, this is exactly uh, what we need to look at. And so when we talk about creative solutions to get us through the next seven months, this is exactly why Paul and Tanya Thorne from Okotoks, why I selected them for our water advisory panel. Um, I, I would say Mayor Thorne has like consistently since I've been in this role, been an advocate for less red tape uh, and changing regulations on wastewater use in my department. And it, it was honestly the willingness to challenge the status quo and be creative uh, and bring some of these, I think, really good ideas from municipalities forward on where we can obviously maintain our high environmental standards because uh, you know the department would say at times when there is of course less water the impact that wastewater would have in our systems is different than at times where we have lots of water um, so that is one of the things we're looking at and I really appreciate the submission Paul you'll bring that forward to our next water advisory panel committee meeting as something that we need to look at but uh, you know what I, I hear you and it's not just that there are other um, regulations or policies in place at the department that I think do limit uh, municipalities doing the right thing. Those are the things absolutely that we want to look at right now. So for any of you in this room, if you have something that, you know, hey, this regulation is really getting in the way of us reusing our water and, and doing the right thing and conserving water moving forward, we need to hear that. Um, so thank you very much. Microphone number two. Good morning, I'm Shannon LaPreeze from Wheatland County. Uh, my comments are for Mi Minister Nixon. Our housing management body has spent about a million dollars to date and is planning to spend another million dollars to develop plans for a new lodge in our community. I know that other HMBs around the province are spending lots of money as well uh, to get the Alberta Housing Partnership Program grant money. So those are, that's a requirement of this grant is to have um, a certain level of uh, budget information and, and that. So this process needs to change so that we have some assurances that grant money, money will be awarded. The gamble is too large for HMBs to spend this much money without any certainty. Well, uh, I appreciate the question, and we'll take that feedback and have a conversation for the next phase of, next round, I should say, of funding. Uh, I, will, I will say this, the most important thing for us uh, is that we have shovel-ready projects. Uh, when I came into this ministry, uh, they sent me on my first announcement to announce a project where the funding was secured eight years before. Uh, the Alberta taxpayer cannot continue to accept waiting eight years to get projects built. And so the money that we're moving out the door right now, we want to be moving to projects that we can get built in the next 12 to 16 months. That doesn't mean that we don't want to fund further projects in next rounds. And so that's the challenge where you got to find the balance is between attempting to make sure that projects are ready to go all the way so we can move it. Otherwise, my friend at the end of the table, the Minister of Finance, won't keep giving us money because they'll beat us up because we have a bunch of money plug in, plugged up but not actually building anything. So that's the balance. The other component is we got to be able to make sure that our other major funder in a lot of these projects is uh, the federal government. And we need to make sure that you're going to meet their requirements as well, or if not, we're going to end up with a bunch of stranded projects, which we have happening now, right now, where the housing provider and or the municipality and us have funded a third, a third, and a third, and we're still waiting on the feds, and they're saying that that project doesn't meet federal obligations. So I take your point about the large investment. I'll take it back, have a conversation with the team about it, but our main objective still is going to be to get that money out the door and get construction workers building houses. 
Thank you, Minister. Uh, before we go to microphone number three, I just wanted to ask, uh, uh, I'm surprised this hasn't come up yet, and hopefully nobody's in line for this, but uh, this is for Minister Jones, the Minister of Jobs, Economy and Trade. And this relates to the Minister's late, latest decision to revoke operational funding to RITAs. And how will your ministry plan to support economic development in rural or remote areas? I thank you for the question. <clears throat> so to be clear, we are we are not reducing supports to RITAs in any way, shape, or form. We are expanding supports for all economic development organizations across the province, and there are a multitude. There are nine RITAs. There's probably 50-plus economic development organizations across Alberta. And we are transitioning to what I would describe as a, as, as a hub-and-spoke model where we support all of them. And I'll tell you how. We, do, we have regional economic development specialists, which are professionals in field that work with RITAs and other economic development organizations. They help them with wayfinding program information. Uh, they provide advice. We have workforce consultants that do the same thing, but on the labor side, and as you know, when you're trying to attract investment, a workforce and labor requirements are probably the number one or number two thing that businesses will be interested in. We have uh, the NRED, the Northern Regional Economic Development Grant, which provides economic development organizations, including RITAs, up to 200,000 in grants for economic development purposes. I'm making RITAs uh, an IGF, which is the Investment and Growth Fund Intake Partner, which means that they will be able to refer potential investors for a $5 million, for up to a $5 million deal closing grant. This is an example of something that's possible under the hub and spoke model, uh, where an incentive like this would never be possible for an individual RITA. So you'll be uh, trying to get a business to come to your area in northern Alberta, and you'll be able to offer them up to a $5 million grant under the new program. We also have a number of labor market uh, and economic data um, uh, dashboards, which I hope you're using. We have about five of them. We're launching a brand new one. It's called the Site Selection Tool. And this is the best tool I've seen government create. It will enable economic developers, including RITAs, to showcase the available sites in your region where investors or businesses could locate. This will save months of work. It is an, really an incredible piece of software. Again, something that no individual economic developer could, could justify. And yet, uh, under the hub and spoke model, all economic developers across Alberta will be able to leverage this. I'm doing other things too. So I have a, a $100 million dedicated to attracting, diversifying film and television investment. I'm making a rural and remote stream so that if they film 75% of their productions in rural or remote Alberta, they can get a higher tax credit, a refundable tax credit of 30%. I'm also putting uh, over a million dollars into uh, regional airport enhancement because I'd like to ensure that our regional airports are viable. Some have been losing commercial air traffic. And so we're going to be, I'm going to be working with Minister Dreeshen in Transportation and Economic Corridors to bolster our regional airports. And then there's other programs that have recently been set up as well. Under Agriculture and Irrigation, we have the Small Communities Opportunities Program, which provides up to 100,000 in grants, again, for uh, economic development. And uh, so uh, the, the, uh, you know, the, the question is around the transitional funding. I'm providing up to 125,000 per year for the next three years to RITAs as they transition to what I would call operational self-sufficiency. Uh, this is the highest funding in history. And I think it's important that uh, RITAs are accountable to their local membership uh, and that they produce for their local membership. I've indicated about nine different programs and millions of dollars that I'm providing and making available to RITAs. Uh, historically, they have not uh, all applied for the NRED grant uh, or utilized the Regional Economic Development Specialists. I hope they use the Investment and Growth Fund. It's an incredible tool. On uh, the RITA side of the partnership, I expect them to do what they do best, which is to build regional... Uh, collaboration and regional buy-in, and we will we will provide them a comprehensive range of tools, resources, and supports and incentives to help them do what they do. Thank you. Okay. Well, that was number question three. Mar question for microphone three, and now we're back to microphone three. Good morning, Councillor Don Slipchuk, MD of Bonneville. This question is for the Minister of Environment. We are all acutely aware of the current moisture situation across the province. The official fire season has already been activated and drought conditions exist in many regions throughout the province. Municipalities have been asked by the Minister of Environment to reduce and conserve water where possible. Throughout all of this, the oil and gas sector continue to use water for downhole purposes at a significant rate. 
Draining dugouts, treated water, and water diversion from the Alberta lakes and rivers are all sources being used to support the oil and gas industry. There are other methods available to the industry. So my question is, will the minister step up and demand the oil and gas industry to find alternative methods to operate their sites that won't empty farmers' dugouts, deplete regional aquifers, and lower our rivers and lakes? I, I do get this question a lot, and I'm glad that you asked it. So in addition to asking municipalities to look at ways to conserve water, the AER also did reach out at the same time to uh, our energy industry, asking them uh, to do the exact same. Uh, however, there does seem to be, I get a lot of questions from media about this as well, um, but there seems to be a little bit of, um, well, they don't often report the facts about how much water is actually used. So when we look at um, our overall allocations, oil and gas is only 10% of all water allocated, and over 82% of water used in Alberta oil and gas, um, this is based on two years ago, is recycled. That said, you're exactly right. We are working with industry as well on, uh, you know, in some cases, I mean, for example, one of the, the examples that was raised with me earlier, and this is something that's already been addressed, was some regulations around uh, lay flat hose, for example, was getting in the way of re reusing water for fracking. Um, we want to see those kinds of uh, ideas coming forward as well, so you're exactly right. We, we are working with all of our major water users, um, including oil and gas to look at how we can reuse even more water. I mean, yes, of course, 82% of, of water being used um, b having been recycled. I actually think that's pretty good. But of course, I think that there's always more work to do. And we're having the same conversations when it comes to ag and irrigation. And, and RJ can talk a little bit about that more tomorrow as well. Um, but we've had people raise, uh, you know, examples of comparing uh, have we looked at feedlots here versus feedlots in the U.S.? Have we looked at our irrigation practices to make sure that we are maximizing? I know the irrigation districts have some great ideas about that. Um, I'm very encouraged about it, ab about the ideas that are coming forward and the changes that we may want to see because I think, again, while it's, it's necessary to get us through the next seven months, um, it's also necessary uh, to make sure that we're able to maximize our water allocation uh, for generations to come. So thank you for raising that? Absolutely, the answer is yes, uh, and we're going to continue to ask all of our major industries uh, to, to find ways to do, to do better with water. Thank you very much. Microphone number one, please. Yes, good morning. Jim Wood, Mayor of Redger County. Uh, Mr. Gene's not here, but for maybe, maybe for uh, Mr. Horner, I don't know, $250 million of unpaid oil and gas taxes. Not only are municipalities out these dollars, but unfairly municipalities must remit school taxes on these defaults. Why? Why is the AER allowed unviable and defunct uh, energy companies to continue operations? Nobody. The province established and is responsible for the actions and inactions of the AER. So why is the Alberta government not ensure the AER does its job? When can municipalities expect the province of Alberta to pay municipalities the $250 million of unpaid taxes owed from these companies. Municipalities cannot afford these non-payment of tax losses by our oil and gas industry and expect to be made whole by the province. Okay, well, I'll, uh, I'll take that. Um, somebody else can chip in if they like. I, 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 Reeve Wood, it's a serious issue. It's why it was a part of my speech this morning. And uh, we have, will continue to, and I made a commitment that our government will continue to work with RMA and municipalities until this problem is solved one way or another. Uh, my goal is to uh, treat the uh, majority of oil and gas companies that are responsible citizens that pay their taxes, that meet their obligations very well. And my objective is to, with the other ones, to correct their behavior or drive them out of business. Uh, because everybody who's going to stay in business has to pay their taxes. Whether you're running a pizza shop or a gas station or a restaurant or whatever other business you want to name, if you don't pay your taxes, it's a short period of time before you're not allowed to operate anymore. And at some point, we need to look, find a way to have that same principle apply. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the answer, Minister. Uh, and just, you, just so everybody knows, too, um, these wonderful people uh, said, Paul, fix it. So I've only just begun. <laughs> I'm going to rock and roll this till my last freaking day. 
<laughs> yeah, your president's been a major, really powerful advocate for you on getting oil and gas taxes paid. I can be a pain in the ass too, sir. <laughs> well, I think that that's what I was saying. I was using more polite parlance. Microphone number two, please. Good morning. Uh, Stacy Barrows, County of Forty Mile. My question's for Minister Glubish. In November, the government announced the Starlink project, which ended on February 16th. The pilot covered a small portion of our county. We received many calls and questions from residents that had minimal to no service, internet service, that were disappointed they didn't fall into this category. I myself didn't fall into the pilot project, but just recently ordered Starlink to help um, better the internet service for our farm business. So my question for you is, now that this pilot project is done, what are the next steps going forward? Because we're not sure how to answer these questions of our residents. Yeah, thank you for the question. So, um, you know, here's what I'll say. First of all, if you look at the broadband strategy that we published in 2022, which provides a funded, credible plan to delivering universal connectivity to every single Albertan, regardless of where they live, by 2027, we did say that there are many different technology tools that will have to play a role. We said there's a place for fiber to the home in some places, and there's some places where that's completely unrealistic. You know, it would cost over $100,000 per home in some places to get fiber there. So we have to look at fiber where it makes sense, and then fixed wireless where it makes sense, which is essentially taking a fiber backbone, adding a tower to it, and then broadcasting the signal out another five or 10 kilometers. But we also know that in some of the most remote parts of the province, low Earth orbit satellite technology is likely to be the best fit. And that's why we decided to do a pilot with Starlink. They're the most advanced so far that has satellites above Alberta. And, um, but we want to figure out like, what's the best way in order to do this, right? Because there's a difference. When you put fiber into the ground, that fiber is attached to that house. When you build a tower, that tower's not moving. When you buy somebody a satellite dish, that satellite dish can move from home to home. So how do we, 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 want, we want to do the pilot say if we're going to subsidize a Starlink dish, for example, how do we figure out the logistics to make sure that you, you don't have to subsidize the same house twice or three times or four times? Because we, we can't do that. Um, so, so we wanted to start small, bite-sized chunks, and test this, test this out. Um, we also know that we can't just scale up and do you know, 20,000 houses with Starlink because they told us it would cost us an arm and a leg as a province to subsidize that in order to get enough satellites. So all of you who have bought Starlink and you're using it and you love it right now, I, I, you, know, you, you don't want me to go and get more people using it than the satellites can support because all of a sudden the quality of your service is going to go down. So as they put more satellites up, they can handle more volume. But if, if we wanted to get 20 or 30,000 houses on Starlink tomorrow, it would cost us tens of millions of dollars to do that on top of just buying the dishes. Um, so that's why we're doing the pilot. To your question, what comes next? Well, we're going to review the results of that pilot, and we'll look at where it makes sense to expand that. Um, and in the meantime, if folks want to get Starlink, they can get Starlink. Um, but here's the good news: a lot of you know this all ties into the broader strategy. How are we doing in terms of tackling the the connectivity gap? When we started, there was 201,000 households that did not have access to high-speed internet. Uh, today, based on all of the uh, funding that we've committed. Uh, there's uh, between what we've committed and the federal government has committed in partnership with us and then in, in terms of what the private sector has built in that same time frame there's hundred and ten thousand households that are either now built or funded to be built uh, with with actual projects that are engineered and ready to go uh, that's 55 percent of the gap that has been met in the first two years of our strategy we've still got another few years to go, and we're committed to getting the job done to make sure every Albertan, regardless of where they live, has access to reliable high-speed internet. Okay, thank you. Microphone number three. Susan Hansen, Clear Hills County. My question is for Minister Glubish. Uh, since we're talking about internet, let's also talk about cell phone service. Uh, we're located in the northwest area of Alberta. We have a population of 3,000, 126 kilometers from border to border. Uh, we have lots of dead zones where there's zero cell service, nothing. We tried to find a solution, talking with the representatives at the different cell phone companies, 
or cell coverage. Co and they keep telling us there's no business case for us. We don't have the population to support the infrastructure. So our ask is for the government to start investigate, sorry, investing into where the GDP comes from and not only based on where the population is, we'd like to know what the solution is for cell coverage in Northern Alberta. Thank you for the question. Um, and look, we, we know it's, it's tricky that, you know, with a geography like Alberta, we've, we've got a lot of space and not a lot of density of population. And so it's, it's challenging to get this infrastructure out. Uh, we've been through this before, right? We know what it was like with getting gas uh, and electricity out to rural corners of the province. Uh, it was the same with landlines. It's the same with internet. It's the same with cell phones. Uh, we've been through this before and we'll figure it out together. Um, I do need to point out that telecommunications are federally regulated, so this is a conversation that you should also be having with your MP uh, and the federal government. I think there's a very big role that they need to be playing, in fact, the dominant role. But uh, we know that as a province, we need to also look for ways to work with our municipal partners to make sure that, uh, that we're supporting the economic growth that comes from the powerhouses of rural Alberta. Um, but here's what I'll say. So I'm, I'm a big believer in technology being a big solution to uh, to the problems that we face today. I, I often say technology is not just an industry, it's the future of every industry. And, and what I, I can tell you is that while I can't give you specifics, I do spend a lot of time talking with all of the telecommunication companies to say, what are your plans for the future? What's the technology that's coming down the pipeline? What are you working on uh, that, that you can't maybe tell everybody about? But let, at least let me know so I can manage expectations. And I can tell you there's some really exciting technology coming that's, that's a, f a few years away that will help uh, to solve this specific problem. So today, if you look at all of Canada, 95% of Canadians have reliable access to cell phone coverage in about 12% of the geography. And that makes sense, right? You know, you look at the major cities, the major highways, that's what's covered. And that covers 95 plus percent of the population. But what these companies are working on now is to make sure that 100% of the geography could be covered with reliable cell phone coverage. I can't tell you the details, but I can tell you, um, rather than us trying to spend billions of dollars we don't have today and, and taking away from healthcare, taking away from housing, taking away from affordability, in order to build with what will soon be obsolete technology, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to look to, to uh, with hope and optimism to what is being developed right now that's going to make a big dent into this. So just, I guess all that to say is hope's on the horizon. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm working hard on this with the telcos to push them to get there faster. Uh, and, uh, you know, so far, uh, so far so good. But let's continue having this conversation, you know, over the next couple of years. Perfect. Number one. Microphone number one. Alan Wilson, Lacombe County. Uh, this is for Mis Minister Lowen and Minister Schultz. A uh, problem that we have in our county, and I assume most that have lakes, is the increasing amount of garbage that people are leaving behind. Then when spring comes, only for it to settle to the bottom. For years we have had signage at access points, launched social media campaigns, and have had volunteer groups clean up truckloads of garbage. Starting a registry for the ice fishing shacks has helped a lot, but most of the negligence I would suggest comes from the day users. Um, we have no jurisdiction to enforce on the lakes, so any help on this matter uh, would be appreciated. I assume fish and wildlife officers, maybe more of them on patrol, Yes, I've, uh, I've heard more and more of these concerns coming forward uh, on the, the, the garbage left on ice after uh, people have been ice fishing. And, and uh, I believe it is, uh, as you suggest, an uh, enforcement issue. Uh, the, the rules are there, the, the legislation's there. Now it's just a matter of making sure that people comply. Um, so I think maybe we can uh, focus our fish and wildlife officers and our conservation officers more on the lakes and at this time of the year to try to do that enforcement. Uh, but beyond that, I'm, uh, I'd be looking for suggestions of any other ideas on that because I'm not sure what else we can do when it comes to that. It's kind of like the, the garbage in the ditches that we see, you know, uh, miles and miles of highway that's uh, totally unnecessary and, and disrespectful and, and illegal too. So uh, again, uh, if you have any other thoughts on it or any other ideas, we'd be happy to, 
to work with you on that. But again, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll make sure that we uh, push our Fish and Wildlife officers and conservation officers a little more in that direction to see if we can alleviate that because it is a uh, huge damage to our lakes and it's unnecessary. Okay, that takes us to microphone two. Justin Stevens, County of Stettler. Um, the 35% property tax reduction on shallow gas wells and pipelines will be extended to the 2021, 22, and 23 taxation years. I have just double checked. It is in fact 24. So I'm wondering if this will end at some point. Um, the justification was a number of factors, including low commodity prices, global economic contraction, and COVID-19 pandemic. I don't know about you, but I, I'm getting really tired of COVID-19 being used as an excuse at this point. So we'll set those two aside. Global economic is in fact growing. So I'm willing to offer a compromise. What if we linked commodity prices to when this would go away and we would finally have an answer so that we can project forward because I am tired of this getting kicked down the road. Okay, well, uh, I'd say that mostly it's not being kicked down the road. There was three different pieces and you get, uh, hopefully you can forgive me and most of you can maybe correct me because I never get the names of each of them right. There was a, uh, uh, a gas, shallow gas holiday that was supposed to be for three days, three years, pardon me, not three days, um, Freudian slip. Um, and that will be for three days, three years, see, I got it wrong twice, three years, not one day more, one, not one day less, three years, that's a fact. One of the other ones went away, you, always, you knew right from the start it was never coming back and it's not coming back. And the third one is, has to do with how we do assessment. And that will be part of our assessment model review. As we get that settled, that'll come back because uh, it, it, uh, it has to do with how we charge for these things. And we are looking at, uh, with you, the correct way to, to allow taxes and provide uh, taxation authority on these things. And that'll be a conversation that you will, you will be involved in, you as RMA and, and as municipalities. And as we get that settled, then that will come back in some form or fashion. So it's, it's, uh, and it's not so much it was a COVID thing, it was, and you could say that three years was too long. Okay, you can argue that, all right, fine. I, I won't even argue with you on that, but a decision was made when oil and gas was selling below zero to give a three-year tax holiday. Again, we can argue whether that was too long or too short, but it's not being kicked down the road. The one that was never coming back isn't coming back. The one that was definitely gonna be three years is gonna be three years, well, not one day more, not one day less. And the other one is involved in the assessment model review that we're working together with the rural municipalities on. Great, thank you, Minister. Uh, actually, before we go to the next one, is anybody talking about renewables? Like we seriously went this long with the renewables? Is anybody that's in line talking about renewable? Can I ask Minister Newdorf at least, like, if, if ever there was, I think we were heard. I don't know, are you guys getting that? So thank you, Minister Newdorf. Um, but my question for you, for you Minister, is, is can you speak to the, uh, the completed uh, inquiry and sort of what are the next steps as it relates to renewables? Yeah, great, thank you. I, I hope you feel heard because I remember very clearly last conference being uh, on this stage and being asked that very specifically. So uh, very happy to have municipalities have legal access before the AUC, as well as apply for funding if they needed to, to make those arguments. Next steps going forward um, is continuing to clarify the direction of our market we are continuing to work with key stakeholders on our transmission regulations. Very critical decisions need to be made there and how that impacts our entire electricity grid. We are continuing to work on the RRO, the regulated rate option, to make sure that we have clear understanding of how th those uh, potential decisions would impact our market. And we are working with uh, the ISO, the Alberta Electric Systems Operator, and the MSA, the Market Surveillance Administrator, as well as stakeholders to uh, finalize our decisions on the, the future direction of our market design, which will uh, enhance um, reliability for our grid and make sure that the surplus generation that we currently have and project into the future 
not only continues to provide stable, affordable pricing for all Albertans, no matter where you live, and yes, we are talking about transmission distribution costs as well, but uh, that we have access to other, other markets outside our borders where uh, we will be able to generate a, a lot of revenue for our economy. What a lot of people don't understand is that, uh, the government doesn't own these generators or all these uh, parts and pieces. They are owned by private enterprise. And when they are strong, economically viable, and profitable, all of our jurisdictions will benefit from that. So that's kind of the, the quick roadmap looking ahead. Thank you, Minister. Again, appreciate your efforts in that. Uh, we've been, we felt heard and looking for the next steps. Appreciate it. Uh, microphone number three. We're in, the, we're in the last nine minutes, folks, so no one else line up. We will do everything we can to get through the last bit of folks. Microphone number three, please. Glenn Elm, MD of Willow Creek. A uh, question for Minister Nixon. Uh, the Porcupine Hills Lodge Foundation in Claire's home has a shovel-ready seniors lodge project. We have everything ready to go. We just need your help to secure $4 million in funding. So I would love to talk to you at some point and see if you can help us with that. We have 25% of the money that we've scrimped and saved for 20 years, and, but we need the remainder. And we've been seven months working and have nothing secure yet. We have a contractor waiting to move, but we need your help. So in the interest of time, because I know we want to get to the last five, there's a nice young man with a bow tie on his way to you right now. We'll get uh, connected. We'll chat about it right afterwards, okay? Thank you. Great. Thank you, Minister. That sounded like a yes to me. Microphone number one, please. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Caroline Colababa, Northern Sunrise County. My uh, question is to the Minister of Environment. I, uh, for years, we've been asking for an agreement between BC and Alberta, and as of yet, neither... The past government or this government has seen to um, get that agreement done. So if you need my help, I would gladly give it to you. Um, the other part is, Mr. Newdorf, uh, Minister, if uh, the urbans, 80% of them live in the urban centres, I would strongly suggest that they put solar panels on their houses and a windmill in their backyard. So thank you. I'm glad you asked that question, and oftentimes it comes up in uh, relation, as I said earlier, to BC Hydro. I know that there have been some uh, northern municipalities that are concerned about the filling of Site C, and so I do just want to let the room know I heard those concerns. I wrote to the BC Minister as well as to BC Hydro and asked them for ongoing communications because... Um, well, essentially, I highlighted that uh, a lot of communities and, and First Nations, quite frankly, felt like they didn't know what was going on. And so you're exactly right. Um, we do have all of the rivers flowing from BC to Alberta. There is the Mackenzie River Basin uh, Transboundary Waters Master Agreement. But you're, you're exactly right that we don't have a specific agreement in place between the two provinces with defined flow volumes or rates. Um, and so that is something that we've been chatting, like discussing uh, at the department level. It's something that uh, I briefly raised with the minister uh, in BC a number of months ago. Um, work would continue uh, on that, but we also need to make sure that, that BC uh, would agree to it, I guess, quite frankly. So uh, work continues. I don't have uh, more of a specific update for you in, in other than just those uh, conversations are ongoing. But again, BC would also uh, have to agree. And so uh, that, that's part of the issue there. But I, I would like a follow-up. Um, so maybe reach out specifically to my office or someone from my office can follow you because it is something I want to dig into uh, a little bit more specifically with the BC minister. Okay. Oh, Newdorf. Microphone. Mr. Yeah. I, I will keep it very short. Uh, oh, that's called me. demand side management, and we are hoping to uh, more fully define what that means and, and making sure generation is at load, which also reduces costs for transmission distribution. Yeah, for the sake of time, he said yes again to. Uh, also, microphone too. Alana Natchew, Sturgeon County. Uh, thank you, Minister Newdorf, for touring Alberta's industrial heartland last week. Appreciate the time that it was taken. Uh, Minister Glubish, I'd like for you to uh, expound on how the Alberta Broadband Fund is more flexible than the federal broadband fund because Sturgeon County has been unsuccessful in getting any provincial support for uh, broadband. And if you're going to reach your targets, I think there needs to be some deployment of capital. So I'd like to understand how much of your budget has been committed and deployed to providing this essential service to rural Alberta. 
Yeah. Uh, look, we've been having this conversation a lot, and I know even just yesterday my chief of staff was talking to one of your officials. Uh, we're, we want to be partners with Sturgeon County. We know that uh, there's there's that you feel like you're falling through the cracks. And some of you in this room may be in the same position. So here, here's the problem is we've got to make sure that we invest in areas that, that need uh, connectivity, not areas that already have connectivity. But the question that I think is a fair question is who decides what meets, uh, what, what, what has connectivity versus doesn't. And right now, because we're partners with the federal government in, in our broadband funding, we're deferring to their maps. And their maps say Sturgeon County has internet, but you and I both know in practice that's not the case. And so I believe you, and I'm tired of the feds continuing to say these different groups don't qualify because our maps say they don't qualify. The maps are old, the maps are garbage, and you and I both know that. So here's what I'm doing about it. Because at the end of the day, I don't care about just putting money towards a problem, I care about getting results. I think that's what you and I both want. And so what I've uh, designed as the next step, and we're going to pay for this out of our broadband funding, is we're going to, we've hired some experts who are going out to areas like yours to actually test the real conditions on the ground so that we can go to the federal government together and say, we have a credible third party analysis that debunks your terrible maps. So let's get this project back as eligible and let's reopen the broadband funding uh, so that we can get a, a real project here that will meet the needs of these citizens. So uh, long story short, I believe you, the maps are garbage. We got to hold the feds to account. The best way to do that is to get a third party analysis and we're going to pay for it. So not sure what more uh, we can do uh, until we get the, the results of that analysis, but we're, we're partners with you and we're going to solve this problem. Thank you. Microphone number three, please. Larry Clark, County of Stettler. This, uh, our neighbors to the south brought this up, Jackie Watts had brought it up earlier, but the disillusion or the viability of small villages uh, puts great fear into us. We have absorbed two villages over the last uh, three to, or I guess up to seven years, and there's two other ones that are in complete disarray with their councils. They uh, have revolving CAOs, and uh, councils have by-elections, they, they are on a steady basis. So confidence in their councils is not very well. Um, Infrastructure is terrible. In one case, uh, grants approved for water reservoir, and new council coming in, they haven't even voted on it, they won't vote for it. Their CAO left, their council left. So um, we, we need to have this looked at, we need help, because we, if we take two of them on, they're both communities of three to 400 people, it will bring us to our knees too, and you'll have us right beside Starland. We'll be, all of us will be on our knees. Because we... Yeah, Larry, I'll give you the same answer I give the other person. I believe you. I know what you, what you just said is true. And uh, while we do have a program in place, what I'm hearing is it needs to be, we need to look at it again to see if it's good enough and see if we need to do more. You got it. I mean, I, I don't know, I'm not sure all, what your full request is, but I know you want us to look at it harder and take it. Uh, I, we are taking it seriously, but you want us to look harder and be more ready. And we're going to take a hard look at that because you and the uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Starland County also asked. Mrs. McIver, if I could just comment, <clears throat> these are all my people <laughs> in, um, in the big country in eastern Alberta. Um, oh, these are my people. You, you have very few people, really, but, <laughs> but uh, I, I, would just, I would just say I, I'm, I'm, glad that, I'm glad that this has been brought up a couple times because it's a, it's a challenging conversation for politicians to have, but I think we can see, we can see what's happening. When I, when I was first elected, I think I represented 30 municipalities, um, down to 27. It'll probably be 25 by the time um, I finish this term. So I think what I what I hear is is people want to understand that there's planning in place that's that's proactive. I think there's a way we can have this conversation with carrots instead of sticks, and maybe avoid a circumstance where uh, the county of Stettler, Starland um, has to has to take on uh, multiple dissolved municipalities at one time. I think it would it would help us 
as we work through this process. So I, I do I do encourage everyone to have this conversation, although it uh, admittedly is a challenging one. And I'd like to um, show that support to to you and and all of your oh, people. Now, now you're on my side. Okay, yeah. thank you, thank you very much. I'm one of your people, sure, yeah. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything like you saw today on the Municipal Affairs, to our in-depth conversations with municipal leaders on the cross-border interviews, and even our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. We are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. Your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, and as always, just keep talking.